Hello, everybody, and welcome to this town hall on Congresswoman Presley's introduction of a federal job guarantee being announced today, a federal job guarantee resolution being announced today. This is an exciting opportunity for us to come together and get the background on what it is, what it's going to do, and why this is such an important moment. And I will tell you, I'm Angela Glover Blackwell, founder in Residence and Policy Link, that I am excited today because Policy Link has been thinking and pushing and hoping that we would begin to have something that we could really latch onto that would make a big difference about economic inequity in America that has become so racialized, so baked in, such a problem. We began thinking about this about four years ago when we were looking for something that we could get behind as an organization that could be transformative. We heard about the work of Derek Hamilton and Sandy Darity, economists who have been really leading the thinking in the nation around this idea of a federal job guarantee. And we invited them to come and meet with us at Policy Link as we were trying to go to school around what would be the ideas that we could really get behind. We were drawn to this one because it got at some of the deepest challenges that we have had as a nation. A federal job guarantee would provide every person who wants a job with an enforceable legal right to a quality job that not just responds to the need for a job, but begins to respond to the needs for human and physical infrastructure in our community, the care that we need for elders and for children, what we need in terms of a, a vital transit system that really, how do we keep that up and make sure that it works? How do we really think about strengthening neighborhoods, all the things that have been needed, and protecting the environment? In, in 2019, PolicyLink joined with a number of other advocates who had been thinking about how important it would be to have a federal job guarantee. And we decided it was time to reach out and see if we could really build demand for it. And together, we put together a job guarantee pledge, and over 500 organizations have joined the pledge at the local level, at the state level, faith communities, workers' rights, climate justice, civil rights. Some of the groups that have joined, just to give you just a sense of the flavor, Community Change, SEIU, One Fair Wage, Sunrise Movement, National Black Worker Center, Demos, we had a number of groups, over 500 that joined. After three years of advocacy, we are so excited about the leadership of Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, who we know for her leadership across the board, but she has stepped in and, and introducing a resolution that calls for a federal job guarantee that would be so essential in terms of closing the racial and gender employment and income gap. And I'm so excited that she has joined us here today to tell us about it. And uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, who's the U.S. Representative for Massachusetts 7th Congressional District, will be joining this conversation, as well as Dr. Derek Hamilton, Director of the Institute for the Study of Race, Stratification, and Political Economy at the New School. Sean Sebastian, who with the People's Action, Senior Strategist with People and Planet First Initiative in Rural America. And Dr. Stephen Pitts, who is the host of Black Work Talk Show podcast, Black Work Podcast. And he is also just uh, retired after 21 years at the UC Berkeley Labor Center. Let's jump right into the conversation and start talking about what is a job guarantee and why do we need it? And to start us off, I'm going to turn to you, Representative Presley, so that you can tell us how it is that you happen to decide to focus in this policy area, why this is so important to you. Also, just provide us an overview of what the key components are of your resolution. And let me say again, thank you. No, thank you. And, and thank you, uh, everyone, for, um, for joining us. And uh, it's always an honor to sit at a table, including a virtual table, uh, with all of these uh, justice seekers and scholars and people doing um, the work of economic justice. You know, I always say that policy is my love language, but this proposal is really um, less about me as a policymaker choosing what I want to focus on and really about framing an agenda. And the, re the resolution is about the promise of the civil rights movement. It's much more about, in the words of the incomparable Coretta Scott, 
uh, who I'm wearing em emblazoned on my, uh, my sweatshirt today, she and Dr. King, the elimination of human suffering. A federal job guarantee is an answer to the resounding demand for a more equitable and just economy. One that really leaves no worker, no family, and no community behind. So often people forget that the March on Washington was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom because economic rights are civil rights. Dr. King's final essay published posthumously called for an economic bill of rights, chiefly a job guarantee. So this proposal really builds upon and honors that unfinished legacy, which is why it is so critically important to my own work. It represents the continuation of the work of the civil rights giants, the black women who have fought for economic justice and liberation for generations. Sadie Alexander, Coretta Scott King, Ella Baker, who so aptly recognize that people cannot be free until there is enough work in this land to give everybody a job. Those are the words of Ella Baker. And I wanna center black women in this moment because it is black women who were paid the least relative to their peers, Black women disproportionately employed in service and low wage jobs who over the course of this pandemic have been deemed essential yet treated as dispensable. And it is black women who must take on the unpaid work of organizing and mobilizing because we continue to deprive our communities of the healthcare education and the housing uh, that they need. A job guarantee, plainly put, is an investment in the American people. It's an investment in our communities, an equitable economy that truly works for all. Now, I'll get into the top line, sort of a, the mechanics of it. Our resolution calls for a federal job guarantee, which would provide every person in America with an, and this is really important, an enforceable legal right to a quality job. It calls for the creation of federal jobs that meet long neglected community, physical and human infrastructure needs, such as, as you referenced earlier, delivering high quality care for children and seniors, building and sustaining 21st century transit systems, strengthening our neighborhoods and protecting the environment. Now, of course, we are building on past legislation, but this resolution and what makes it unique calls for the creation of a permanent program, one that is available to all adults seeking employment and federally funded by a permanent non-discretionary spending. Because we can't let shifting political whims dictate what should be our structural support. So this resolution really considers the systemic barriers that have neglected, rather, that have relegated people and also neglected them, but relegated people to jobs that exploit their humanity and exclude them from the workforce altogether. It guarantees access to the benefits of dignified gainful employment. And those include a humane minimum wage of $15 an hour, healthcare and paid sick days and family leave, a right to a union and the ability to bargain collectively, access to supportive services, including childcare and transportation services, which can otherwise be extremely cost prohibitive to maintain steady remunerative work. Opportunities to build skills and to gain access to higher paying positions through on the job training, as well as paid apprenticeships, credentialing and other career building opportunities. This resolution establishes a job guarantee as a critical facet of a climate friendly economy and also creates a structure to compensate historically under-recognized and uncompensated labor, like domestic and social care, ecological preservation, cultural, scientific, and creative work. This resolution is comprehensive, and what is most important to me, it is responsive. It is responsive to what workers have been demanding for decades. Oh, you're muted, Angela. Thank you. I'm supposed to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the Biden administration has a clear focus on full employment, and the Fed has a mandate to pursue full employment. How does this federal job guarantee uh, fit in with these priorities? 
Well, I so appreciate the question. And, um, you know, this actually all began um, in my line of questioning of Chairman Powell a year ago. I sit on the Financial Services Committee. And so one year ago, I asked Chairman Powell about the Fed's responsibility to pursue full employment, prompting him to admit for the first time on the record that the Fed alone cannot achieve true full employment. By its own admission, the Federal Reserve lacks the necessary tools to do so. So equity and systemic transformation are not going to happen by accident. Uh, we have to be you know, very intentional and robust in achieving that, innovative. We can't rely on economics as usual to address unemployment that's been caused by crises that disproportionately impact our most vulnerable communities. So it's going to take deliberate, intentional policy change resources, and finally prioritizing workers and communities. Job skills training and lower interest rates have never historically succeeded in establishing a true full employment economy in which every individual wishing to undertake paid work can do so. But a job guarantee can. The latest job reports, I mean, these are staggering numbers, showed another 1.4 million initial unemployment claims were filed just this week. That's the 48th straight week claims were greater than the worst week of the recession. So business as usual simply will not do and we simply can't afford to wait. Thank you, thank you for that. I'll come back to you, but I wanna to turn to Derek Hamilton now. Derek, you've been talking about this for a long time. I don't know how many times I've heard you speak about the federal job guarantee. And I was so honored uh, last summer, early, late spring, maybe almost a year ago when we had that op-ed where we were really pushing for the job guarantee. I'm curious, how does this feel to you? How does it feel in this moment? And how would the job guarantee as envisioned by this resolution change things? So how does it feel? Um, there's joy in our work. And I think that's important. I think it's important to reflect and see where you were and where you came. Um, we need a movement to get big, bold justice accomplished. And that's going to take ideas, it's going to take action and advocacy, and it's going to take policy. So these collaborative relationships that we have and that have worked on, um, you know, stemming some ideas and the great work that Policy Link did and taking the ball and running with it, getting all these people to sign on. And then Congresswoman Presley uh, taking the leadership by putting out this resolution. This is how we get things done. And there's joy in this. It, you know, they, I'm, I'm genuinely happy and feel really good about this. Now, of course, we got a long way to go. The sobering reality is a lot of people are suffering. Um, but the, the, the beauty is um, this is a movement and this is what it's about and we're committed to it. And, and I think that's important. It's a movement grounded in good ideas, good economics and justice. The economics are sound. So, you know, the second part of the question, what are some of the things that would come about from a job guarantee? It would literally eliminate involuntary unemployment. That's not pie in the sky. That's something we can achieve. We, allow, we, we make a political choice to allow for unemployment. We can make a different political choice. We get rid of the oxymoron of working poverty altogether. Obviously people working 40 hours a week shouldn't be poor. In fact, nobody should be poor, but at the very least we can do that. Um, it would remove the threat of unemployment so workers in general could have better bargaining power. It would be an implicit floor for our labor market. Labor markets are about power. We need to better enable workers where they can go to work without that threat that they can be at, at the whim unemployed so that they can negotiate better in ways that we might not even conceive of. When we have economic downturns, we heard in the last recession, we had the moral hazard of having to bail out banks for some of their malfeasance that might have gotten us to, and it's not just banks, it would, whatever, the financial industry that might have got us to a certain position by having products in the market that were irresponsible, that had too much risk, that were in some ways predatory. Well, we won't be beholden in the future if we have a federal job guarantee to address that moral hazard because the federal government would have in place the mechanism so that uh, people won't suffer so much. You know, I won't go on and on and on, but I, I can say that there are many. It would reduce the strain on state and local budgets. It would transform our economy from low wages to moderate and high wages, you know, people make the argument, well, what's it going to do to low wage work? Won't it eliminate and get rid of low wage work? 
that's not necessarily a bad thing. If, if, if we ensure that every worker has a, a good quality job, why shouldn't we aspire to that? That, that is something we can do and what, something we should do. And the racial dimensions, well, it would mitigate some of the, the problems associated with labor market discrimination by, by demonstrating that everybody has access to a quality job, regardless of their gender, their race, et cetera. Um, so it does so much. It, it, and again, at the risk of not going on and on and on, we can direct resources to areas that need them most. So, you know, we, we know that the program is counter cyclical. So it, it starts getting bigger when there's an economic downturn, when we need federal stimulus, when we need to ensure that workers have a job. It starts to decrease when we have an expansionary economy. That's an automatic stabilizing effect that's good. It's a, it, it'll be uh, demand stimulating so that when we do need more aggregate demand, the, the program kicks in. But here's something else that it does. It directs resources, regardless of whether it's a business cycle or not, towards areas that need it most. So if we have areas of the country that for whatever reason, the closure of a factory, it's starting to dilapidate. Well, this is when a federal job guarantee kicks in. It sends resources to those areas. We can define the economy we want with this program. We can have a care economy. We can have a green economy. We can you know, the future really is boundless. And this ain't pie in the sky. This is the point of government. If we're going to have an industrial policy, center workers, center people and direct resources in, in the areas that we need it most. I think that you answered my second question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because you might want to add a little bit. For many people, the economy is just a black box. And whenever you're trying to talk about changes, people just throw up, oh, the economy can't accommodate that. This, the economy doesn't work that way. Could you just give us some talking points for when we're out there trying to get behind this idea of a federal job guarantee? What's the impact from an economic perspective? Yeah. But you know, as an the, thing, mm -hmm. the thing we need to begin with, and Here's a failing of my discipline. My discipline does a lot of things right. My discipline, I'm proud, is grounded in rigor and is in, interested in important questions. But what my discipline doesn't do right is begin with values, begin with a set of conditions that we desire. We, we start with some inevitability that we presume that inequality is inevitable. We presume that poverty is inevitable. It's not. Uh, we, if, if we define what it is we want, you know, markets are political constructions. Even a farmer's market where, you know, we think that's the purest type of, 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 of interaction uh, of just trade sellers and buyers is defined by somebody who gives a permit to allow you to say, sell your goods and services, right? So I think to begin with, in, in a broad perspective, we need to understand that first we determine what it is that we want. What, what, what is the moral foundation and values that we want? So we can decide to set a floor and ensure that as, you know, just like Congresswoman Presley said, if, if we want to set up a, a floor and define that people will have a civil right to a job, it is something that's achievable. And, you know, I can get into costs and things like that. Um, it is achievable and foreseeable. And uh, again, grounded in the first step, is that indeed what it is we want to do? And then the economic benefit, benefits are manifest in so many ways that I just described. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the idea that we can direct resources to where we want to go. We have the benefits of an automatic stabilizers. We get rid of some of the immoralities around somebody's identity having transactional value as it relates to having a job or not. We, we can make a choice to get rid of that. Wow, oh, thank you, thank you. Let me turn to you, Sebastian. First, I want you to just say a word about the network that, that you are engaged in. But then, why is your network in support of this federal job guarantee resolution? And what does it mean for the workers in the communities that you serve? Yeah, thank you so much, Angela. And uh, it's such an honor to be part of this panel. Um, we go way back with um, you and Derek, and it's great to meet you, um, Representative Presley. People's Action is a network of 40 different member organizations in 30 different states doing the day-to-day, -day, on the ground work of building relationships with working with a multiracial base of working class and poor people. 
we have organizations like in New York, like Vocal New York, um, organizing primarily Black people in New York City. And we have organizations like Hoosier Action in Indiana, organizing primarily poor rural white folks. And uh, organizations like Lucha in Arizona that organize immigrants in Arizona. So we run the gamut and we are trying to build that multiracial democracy. And we represent our organizations, the 40 organizations represent all kinds of different people. And the reason we signed on to the job guarantee is because a job guarantee is essential for everyone that we organize from coast to coast, across race and place, across gender, across age. It is essential for all of us. And you know, I think it's incredible. I want to actually quote um, Coretta Scott King, and I just want to say, like, it's incredible to see the continuation of this legacy from Coretta Scott King to the work that you all have done to the resolution being passed today with uh, Representative Presley. Coretta Scott King says, we are going to have meaningful jobs, jobs that would serve some human need as long as there are people, you're going to have healthcare needs, educational needs, things that you know will make for a better quality of life. And that's what we're talking about is a better quality of life. Um, Dr. Hamilton said it's a political choice to allow for unemployment and that this bill would remove the threat of unemployment. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine looking at your family? and knowing you will always be able to provide for them. Can you imagine living in your community and knowing that you can do meaningful work to help your community? That threat is gone. Imagine the weight that falls off. And that's, when I think about the weight that would fall off the members of our network, the that are struggling right now to provide for their families. That is something that is common across. This is an idea and a legacy built by Black women that helps every single person in the United States. And that weight is something that if we are free from, can you imagine how much space that opens up, how much space it opens up to love our families, to have time with our families, to do the highest and best things that we can for our communities. Um, it's incredible. And I will say that a lot of the work that I do is in rural America. And I think um, it's important to note that one in five people in rural America are people of color. They're black, indigenous, immigrant people. But this is something that is especially important in rural America. There are so many things that need to be done. There is so much work to do to improve communities, particularly in rural America. We need to upgrade rural water infrastructure. We need hospitals. We need, we need education. The kind of pillars of actual employment in agricultural communities are already schools, hospitals, and post offices, right? Those are already public jobs. If we expanded those um, those pillars to provide jobs and to provide more services, it would transform life for so many people. Thank you. Thank you. I love the human dimension to the way that you talked about it. It is so important. And I want to turn to you, Stephen, um, from a labor perspective, how does a job guarantee build worker power? Yeah, um, one, I'm really glad we're here. I mean, thanks for inviting me on this panel. It's just important, very important conversation. I think it's important, and I'll get you a question in a second, Angela, because I think that, you know, for the last, like, gosh, since the mid 70s, we've been in what I call the age of inequality. There's been really a beat, we've been under a beat down with rising inequality and associated problems. Um, and what, what race does is accentuate those problems itself. And one thing we have to do now is put forth a vision for a better world. But people talked a lot about in the 60s of the beloved community. And I mean, that has to be the framework that we're trying to, to not have the super smart policy that we can pay for. We're trying to construct a better world for my, grand, my grandson. That's the starting point. It's truly the, the starting point. And, 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 and given that this notion that part of the better world says that folks should have a job as a right is a cornerstone. Oftentimes in the quest for the, the smart policy, we have the kind of battle over mine smarter than yours. And my thing is that's kind of irrelevant. The question is simply, how do we dream a world that can move a folk to run through a brick wall and change this world? And so I'm glad that this is part of that, that new vision. I'm glad we're doing this. Um, 
I'm co-founder and board chair of the National Black Worker Center Project. And we have eight affiliates around the country. And in terms of how this would help our groups and, and their work, some of what, what, what Sean said also is that one, people we deal with have jobs. Um, also, I think very important to the extent that there are not unions present, it is essential that those folk in those jobs programs get into organizations. Derek spoke a lot about the question of power. At the end of the day, when we talk about wages, benefits, other conditions, the chief determiner of that is power. And it comes both from this idea of trying to reduce the threat of unemployment, being a mitigating factor of the power workers need and deserve, but equally important, the power comes from collective action. And I think back to what happened during the 60s, the Model Cities program. And one of the controversial parts of that was this notion of maximum of participation. And deal with that, what we're gonna do, you're gonna actually empower community residents to actually implement the program itself. The notion of building power is crucial to building a better world. And so in the labor market component of that, we have unions. And when, you, when unions don't exist, we need other forms of organizations. I hope it's important when we speak about this idea of guaranteeing jobs, we don't just speak of things that being an individual has a job and we're done. And maybe the individual has better power because of less unemployment, but we find ways to make sure that all people are in an organization, be it a union or not a union, so they can collectively impact the conditions at work and the conditions in the community. But I'm so super excited about doing this, y'all. It's really super important. Thank you. Um, it is so important on so many levels. And when Derek and I did the op-ed back in spring of 2020, we were at the front end of this pandemic. And we were saying then that if we had a federal job guarantee, we wouldn't be wringing our hands as a country over contact tracing and how to produce more PPE and how to be able to make sure that we were getting schools safe and doing outreach for small businesses. There was so much that needed to be done. We could have stepped right in. Uh, as Congress, and the new administration start to think about an economic recovery and infrastructure packages, how's the job guarantee fit in? And how do we begin to make that case? I'll start with you, Representative Presley, but I'd love to hear from anybody who has thoughts about it. Well, before I answer that, I, I just, um, I wanted to just uh, share a moment um, in the hours leading up to our uh, public introduction um, that we would, um, uh, our public announcement that we would be introducing this resolution. Um, I, I had an emotional moment uh, with my senior aide who uh, crafted this, um, Aya Ibrahim, a black woman. And I was thinking about the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom and that story that has been told by so many that Dr. King was not actually supposed to give that speech. He actually was supposed to give a different speech um, but defaulted to ostensibly what was one of his stump speeches because someone behind him said, tell them about the dream. And I really do feel in so many ways um, to have the honor to pick up this mantle um, to, to further advance economic justice um, and this work for which the ground was laid with Dr. King and Sadie Alexander and Coretta Scott King um, and Ella Baker, that just in the telling of this, that is what we are doing. We are telling people about the dream. The recent inauguration, Amanda uh, Gorman, uh, in that, uh, that beautiful uh, uh, spoken word and, and call to action um, that she offered us, said that we seek not a more perfect union, but a more purposed union. And when I think about those black men wearing those signs, those sanitation workers, I am a man. When I think about Dr. King elevating the fact that um, poverty and economic exploitation and racism and militarism are all connected and you can't do away with one without doing away the other. This moment with this new administration who asserts that they want to build back better. This moment culturally where everyone is using the word quite casually of a national reckoning. A reckoning is something that is quite literally of epic proportion. So we need to be advancing um, solutions of epic proportions. 
of epic innovation to meet the scale and scope of the crisis. The current public health crisis and the crisis of 2008 have really proven that our black and brown folks, our workers can't afford a piecemeal time bound legislative approach that allows unemployment insurance and paid leave to expire and then scales back direct cash assistance or what we're calling survival checks. So our status quo economy, it's not compassionate, it's brutal. Our, our economy leaves millions of people in search of work. Our economy forces people to work 80 hour minimum wage jobs, um, you know, hour a week jobs to feed their families, to race to three different jobs, to pay their bills. That should not be the normal that we aspire to return to. A job guarantee would deliver the reforms that workers have demanded for decades by creating quality jobs for anyone who wants one. It would force private employers to improve wages, benefits, and work conditions to compete for workers. Coretta Scott King said, contempt for the working man is violence. You know, we have a violent economy. So this would increase the power of the 40% of workers who earn less than $15 per hour and drastically reduce the number of the working poor. And while this should be a key tenant of our country's economic future, a job guarantee is also reparative. Again, we keep talking about a reckoning, it's reparative. Racial justice policy. So we remain in the midst of a national a reckoning on racial injustice. And, and again, as a child of the church, a reckoning is of biblical proportions. So let's act accordingly. If Congress and the Biden administration wanna meet the scale and scope of this crisis and truly ensure a just and equitable recovery, then a job guarantee needs to sit at the top of that priority list. It's just so significant for, for black, uh, Latinx, indigenous households, because routinely we are the first ones hired and the last ones hired and the first ones fired. So those who are already marginalized, including those with disabilities and transgender folk facing discrimination, hiring discrimination, make up a disproportionate number of low wage workers. These households have been forced to, to shoulder the greatest burden uh, of our national crises and, and are the last to recover, if ever. So um, we're telling people about the dream and affirming what we know to be true, that economic justice has always meant racial justice. Mm. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on, Derek, it looks like you want to speak. I'll jump in really quick and say, that I love that explanation and say that it, it's the dream grounded in strong economic policy. That there's rigor behind this dream that we can bring it to fruition. I mean, that, that we need to really grasp. It's not pie in the sky. And related to what you said when you let the question off, Angela, we can't have the perfect foresight to see what's going to happen in the future. But a program like this gives us the infrastructure to deal with it. It gives us, as you point out, the right question was, what, how much better off we, would we have been if we had a federal job guarantee in place before the pandemic? We don't know the next pandemic. We don't know the next crises but something like a federal job guarantee builds up the infrastructure and provides the worker protection and invest in an economy that will not only benefit workers directly, but also all of us by building up that infrastructure um, in, in a way that, that, uh, that we need. Angela, can I, can I add one more thing, Angela? Please, please I think do. Also, I think also it's important because it's important to restore people's faith in the power of the government. I think that part of the, the beat down of the last 50, 40, 50 years now has been that government has been the problem supposedly. And the result of that is our inability to respond to the pandemic. The result is the problem happening in Texas now, where because of the so-called individualism, they went off the national grid and people are freezing to death literally. And so it's important part of the story because it's not just the idea of forget a job that folks should have. We're saying that we have problems as a people, as a people we can solve those problems and we actually do it. That's so very, very important. Uh, unless you want to say something on that, I'll go on and then we'll come back, Sebastian, and give you a chance. I want to talk about this in the context of the future of work. We're always, we all past few years, we've been going to conferences about the future of work. I mean, <laughs> we, we've really beat that one up. Um, 
And lots of things have been coming forward. Um, income guarantee, a lot of things. Let's talk about the future of work and how does this begin to respond to that? Uh, some of the threats that we've seen. Um, Sebastian, do you wanna weigh in on that one and then we'll hear from others? Sure, sure yeah. Um, so I think that the key to the job guarantee is dignity. And I think that um, just building off of what um, Dr. Pitts and Dr. Hamilton have been saying um, and uh, Representative Presley, you know, we look at our basic human needs and to go back to that Coretta Scott King quote about healthcare needs, childcare needs, basic human needs, the private sector isn't coming to so many of our communities to deliver those basic needs. The private sector is not delivering food to people who need it. The private sector is not delivering healthcare to people who need it. You know, even something simple like broadband, the private sector is not delivering broadband to people who need it. We take care, we have the opportunity to take care of ourselves and the, what this crisis showed us was right next to each other, someone who desperately needed a job and next to them, someone who desperately needed help. They desperately needed groceries delivered to them. They desperately needed medical attention. And the only thing that was not connecting them was a job guarantee, mm -hmm. right? If they had a job guarantee, those two people would be connected. They would each have what they need and they would be better off. And I think that is the future of work. I think we have seen the future of work defined by tech monopolies that work to undermine worker rights, that work to steal pennies from people who are making pennies. And I think the future of work is the future of us caring for each other in our community. Thank you, I thank you. And so we need it, we need it. Clearly, we have made the case here in ways that I'm sure have excited the people who are listening and will excite the people who listen to this later on. But Representative Presley, now how do we build from the resolution to seeing a federal job guarantee? And what can we do out here? You're in there in Congress, we're out here. What do we do as supporters to put this on speed up and to make sure the demand is there and to make sure that you know that we are grateful and we say it with more than thank you. We say it by getting our bodies out on the street to be able to, we do what needs to be done to get it. You help us, what do we do? Uh, as I've said so often before, you know, save your words of appreciation. Policy is my love language. And so, um, you know, uh, in that vein, this is very consistent with, um, you know, other initiatives that I've introduced such as my people's justice guarantee, which really sought to provide a new North Star um, a new frame uh, to radically reimagine our criminal legal system. And I introduced multiple bills to support that uh, overall framework. And so the same will be true in terms of what I do legislatively when it comes to a federal job guarantee. Um, so the next step is really just building and implementing the core components of this program, um, which are gonna require multiple acts of Congress. So again, my resolution is laying out this framework, the dream, the vision, for what a true federal job guarantee, guarantee can be. And, and it will be guided um, you know, by my colleagues um, in partnership uh, to make it a, a reality. And then of course we do have, uh, as, as evidenced uh, by our uh, discussion here today, economists, advocates, union and community leaders, uh, they've provided their insights on what a federal job guarantee must look like to effectively serve our community. So I'm gonna continue to listen to them. Um, I always seek for my legislation um, to be responsive. So I'm gonna continue to actively listen to them and to center the voices of those who fight for workers uh, every single day. But again, this is really just the beginning and we're gonna continue to build momentum to organize co-sponsors uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and the resolution, in addition to sort of a North Star framework, uh, is an invitation. It's an invitation for community leaders and my colleagues to come forward with proposals um, that meet local leaders and ladder up to this vision. So what does the future hold? More bills, <laughs> bills that support uh, this, this uh, vision, which is not abstract. You know, it can um, be realized and it can have uh, a systemic and transformative impact. And I think it is very timely that we're introducing it right now um, in the midst of this discussion about a reckoning 
in the midst uh, as we enter into what Reverend Barber refers to as a third reconstruction, um, it's very timely as we continue to enumerate goals around uh, climate justice and economic justice and racial justice and a just and equitable recovery from the pandemic. So it's very timely. Now, what can folks do as community builders in this third reconstruction who are stakeholders and who believe um, in the, and are committed to the actualization of a federal job guarantee? You know, again, we're very fortunate in that we've had so many organizations that have already endorsed this, like SEIU, the Sunrise Movement, uh, People's Action, the Center for Popular Democracy, um, you know, Policy Link, again, incredible partners. So I'm, I'm proud to have the support as well of people like um, Adi Barkin, uh, Sarah Nelson, and I encourage and welcome the support of others. Um, so contact your representatives and express your support for this resolution and urge them to co-sponsor. Um, as Dr. King said, who we keep evoking in this moment, organize, baby, organize. Uh, he did say that. <laughs> and make it clear that a truly just and equitable economic recovery must include a job guarantee. I thank you. And I'm going to open it up for questions, but Sean and Stephen and Derek and Representative Presley, you have been extraordinary in terms of really reminding us to tell them about the dream. I love that, tell them about the dream. And when we put something forward to not just come small, but to think about the scale and scope of what this violent economy has been doing to workers and to all of us. And to know that this is the time for something epic. We really need an epic solution. And we have the capacity in this moment, which is unlike any I have seen as I've been doing this work for many decades. We have a moment to be epic in, in our dream and in our actions. I thank you and let's see what the audience wants to know. I'm gonna to turn to <laughs> Tracy Ross, who I think is ready to bring on some questions. Yes, thank you, Angela. And thanks to everyone who submitted questions. Uh, there were many, so I'm gonna combine a few. If your question is not asked, you can visit jobguaranteenow.org where we have frequently asked questions. The first one um, that we've seen pop up a few times was uh, the question around what it will cost and if cost matters. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly appreciate the intent with which the question was asked and um, as someone who is new to Congress, but not the work of lawmaking, uh, having served on the Boston City Council prior to my election to Congress, I can, can tell you I'm very familiar uh, with that question and with the, um, the unjust and I consider really false binary choices that are often foisted uh, onto us uh, when it comes to um, how to truly, truly center the needs of the people and how to meet them. You know, I think it's really ironic that every time we push for bold policies that do center people in those most impacted, whether you're talking about, um, you know, student debt or paid family leave, um, just as a two quick examples or childcare, we're most always met with the same critiques of how will we pay for it? Uh, how can we best target relief? Last year, Congress passed a 750 billion, that's with a B, funding bill to bankroll the Pentagon and defense contractors, all while arguing that direct payments to put cash in people's pockets, survival checks, are too expensive in the midst of a public health pandemic, no less. So like anything that is a priority, we really do believe that a budget is a statement of our values, um, then we should appropriate the funds. It's not a matter of um, of resource, you know, so often I, I've, I've asserted that we don't suffer from a deficit of resource, it's a deficit of empathy, you know, and people are experiencing a tsunami of hurt and we can relieve it. And the reality is that we're already paying by not paying for this. You know, what's the cost of having millions unemployed or tens of millions paid an unlivable wage? or hundreds of thousands being unhoused or facing homelessness. The only thing we can't afford right now is the status quo or an economic recovery that level sets us to what was already an insufficient and unjust quote unquote normal. We really, you know, Professor Hamilton speaks about this often. 
um, as does my, my sister in service, Representative Ocasio-Cortez. We just can't buy into this, this false scarcity narrative because the money is there. And we, we can't allow these policy decisions to be made at the expense of our communities any longer. You, you want to speak to it here, Derek? You want to add to this? And again, I'm going to be brief because I know there are lots of questions. We can do the accounting exercise and we've done it. So we can give actual numbers to it. But the Congresswoman highlights it just fine in the sense that budgets are priorities. So the real question is, do we have the capacity? And the resounding answer is yes, we've demonstrated capacity. Then now it's the question of choice and do we want to implement it as well as all the other benefits that come about from it and in relation to the, the cost that, that, that we experience if we don't address those, those things, the cost of unemployment as, as was, was mentioned. Um, and you know the fact that the program gets more expensive and economic downturn, that's a feature, not a bug. That's when the government should be spending more. That, that's when the government should be running a deficit. And matter of fact, we need to redefine that term deficit because investments in our most treasured resource, which is people, should not be defined as a deficit. That, those are just that, investments in the American people. Thank you. Tracy? We have a few questions about the uh, universal basic income and how it relates to federal job guarantee. Are they intention? Are they, um, are they uh, complementary? Uh, I'm sure several people will want to speak to it, but one of the things that I really think is that we need to look at all of the supports that we need and not assume that we can only do one or another. They, it seems to me they complement each other nicely. And I've heard Derek say that a couple of times, um, but anybody who wants to speak to it, please. I mean, I'll jump in really quick and say that I'm all for income guarantees, but UBI is a whole nother, a whole nother dimension. And it, the sad thing is when you know we talk about values and then the economic policy, and for me, the UBI, perhaps some people have it grounded in the right values, which is why I support income guarantees, but the actual policy of literally giving everybody the same dollar amount throughout the economy, to me, is akin to inflation, and is also akin to any income or inequality enhancing. You give a poor person a dollar, their subsistence, by definition, they consume it. You give a rich person a dollar, not only do you not get the stimulus effect because they save it, but you also increase wealth disparity. So there's, better, there's a better policy way to achieve what King had in mind and several others, which is an income guarantee. And it does seem that the field has moved to where you are. In the beginning, people were saying universal basic income, but now income guarantee is the way I hear it. And the uh, numerous pilots that have popped up around the country are using the language of income guarantee. So it does seem that we're moving in that way. Uh, Congresswoman, Stephen, anybody else want to comment on that one? Tracy, back to you. Great. We also have uh, a few questions um, wondering about the people involved in a job guarantee. How will this um, impact people who are in unpaid home care work, whether it's caring for an elderly parent or relative or um, their children, and then also the people who might not be able to work full time or have barriers to employment, whether it's because of disability or some other uh, barrier? Sure. Well, again, as I was saying earlier, you know, Dr. King spoke about the three, the three evils and included economic exploitation in that. And that is as much about um, those that are, are unemployed as those that are uh, underemployed um, and uh, those that are exploited with free labor, right? Um, as someone who was a caregiver to my mother, may she rest in peace and power. Um, in the, uh, the final stages of her battle with leukemia, it's really past time to acknowledge the value of the millions of hours of unpaid care work being done, and more importantly, to begin paying people uh, for that labor. I think you can go to the next question, Tracy. There's a few questions about how a program like this would be administered given our fractured uh, workforce development system. So um, any general thoughts related to that as well as uh, the role of state and local governments? I'd love to hear from Dr. Pitts on that. <laughs> Tapping you in. 
<laughs> I see that. Um, there's always there's always payback though. Don't worry about it. It's always payback. Okay? <laughs> um, so I don't have a lot of a lot of deep expertise, but I think that you need to look at a combination of both. If our federal system worked properly, so we can't have states off the grid, but you need to have both the large federal standards as you're trying to develop and apply the program, and the flexibility to meet the needs in the area itself as dictated by the people themselves. That's why I reference, referenced before the question of model cities and the stipulation around maximum feasible, feasible participation. So it's not just a matter, matter of giving the governor of Texas input or that sort of person. It's how do you actually go into Houston or San Antonio or El Paso and Dallas Fort Worth or someplace in the Valley and have people themselves and the church the organization have impact over the nature of the jobs that are being guaranteed and how it's implemented both in terms of recruitment, monitoring and building worker power. So some combination of general sort of federal guidelines, so basic standards of how it's applied across the nation itself, but also make sure we go deep into communities, not just at the state level, into communities to make sure that the people themselves have input over the design and implementation of the programs. I see Sean nodding his head. I don't know if he wants to weigh in there. You're okay, all right. We also have a, oh, go ahead, Angela. No, I just wanted to say, I wanted to underscore what uh, Stephen was just saying about communities. This half of this is work and half of this is the work that needs to be done. And people in communities know what needs to be done. We just have not had a mechanism to be able to make it happen. And this is beginning to create that, that that would happen. Go on, Tracy. We had a few questions actually about um, opposition. Um, I'll take liberties and, and share that today um, Gallup uh, revealed that 93% of people support a job guarantee and nine in 10, um, nearly nine in 10 Republicans support a job guarantee. So for the uh, minimal opposition, um, what are the sorts of messages and frameworks that will be necessary to, to win more folks over? Derek, why don't you go? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm actually going to thoughts on that. You start with that. <laughs> you know, that's a hard one, of course. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, part of the reason we get opposition to these big, bold ideas is the fact that we have an unequal society to begin with. In other words, if we had, as Stephen mentioned earlier, uh, a government that was known for being um, high efficacy and doing their job in, in addressing these problems of structural inequality, we'd be less susceptible to despotic messages that put one, one people against another. We'd be less vulnerable to these notions of who's deserving and who's not deserving and what a handout is. So the irony is that a program like the federal job guarantee itself would diffuse the opposition. <laughs> so that, that, that would be my answer. I actually have to do something that's impolite and run. But before I go, I want to say thank you to everyone and give a big shout out to Helen Lax Ginsburg, who passed away last year, but was a big champion of this and part of the National Jobs Wall Coalition. And then also, shameless plug, is a new school alum. So, thank, oh, all right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Be good, Derek, man. Be good, man. Anybody else want to comment on how to be able to deal with the opposition? Yeah, I, I'd love to comment on this because I feel like it's so resonant with the current moment. Um, Tracy mentioned that the job guarantee has a 90% approval rating. Can you think of any other policy that has a 90% approval rating? Like this is a universally, un this is universally understood as a as a public good for everyone. And I think the right wing, which represents corporations that find everyone having a job, a guaranteed meaningful public job to be a threat will try to create a disconnect, try to, try to actually remove people from what they know in their gut, which is this is a good idea, right? So I think like, I think what we're seeing now is similarly with the reconciliation package going through, 83% of people are in favor of a $1.9 trillion reconciliation package and 50 Republican senators are trying to stop it, right? So what we have is not a problem of public will. What we have is a problem in representation. 
And I want to add one thing on to that. I, mean, I hope when people talk about trying to deal with opposition, we don't talk about compromises. Because the problem really is a question of asymmetry of power. <laughs> that that, that where well, you may have 95% of people in favor of it, you have people in Congress who actually try to assault Representative Presley. She's, I don't know how you do that, by the way, how you deal with people you know don't want you there. But that aside for a second, that's the real issue itself. And it's a matter of how to actually amass the power needed to persuade enough people to do what needs to be done for the broad swaths of our society. And it does seem that the people are elected officials because if the poll tells you what the people want, the people think that everybody ought to be guaranteed a job. And yet we know to move this, there's gonna be a battle, but we shouldn't confuse uh, how it is that the people are responding with how a few people who are elected officials just dig in in a negative way. It, it, we know that there'll be a battle, but we need to really understand how to capture the imagination and the energy of the people to lessen the strength of those who wanna fight against something that is very much needed. Uh, I would also just say that, that I do believe that, you know, historically um, we're well positioned and primed for this moment because you know, the thing about these three crises, um, the, the pandemic and the economic hardship that it has wrought and um, this awakening for many, although no one at this virtual table as to the threat of white supremacy and systemic and structural racism is that, you know, we saw at least in the house, we were able to get things in, in our relief package that were obstructed by the GOP led Senate, but that had previously been non-starters. And that is because of the unprecedented hurt. So all of a sudden we can get paid leave in when that was a non-starter. You know, all, all of a sudden, you know, people are prepared to have a conversation of, you know, canceling some semblance of student debt because this is a $2 trillion crisis. And under the previous administration, 54,000 people had wages and benefits garnished during a pandemic. So when that happened, so that's how we know that it's not a deficit of resource, that this has been about representation, uh, political will, political courage. Um, and as we're so often reminded about uh, LBJ's conversation with Dr. King, make me do it. So, you know, we just have got to keep organizing and mobilizing to insist that our values are legislated. But I do believe in this moment, um, there are less detractors and naysayers because so many things that we've been told were improbabilities and impossible have been realized in the midst of this tsunami of hurt. Whether it's emergence of collective care and mutual aid, you know, about what's really possible, or from a legislative standpoint. I, I thought that they said that we couldn't feed every child that was hungry at school, but we found a way, we insisted on finding a way to do that in the midst of this pandemic, just as, just as one example. Thank you, Tracy. It looks like we're about out of time. I bet you have many more questions. You wanna tell people how you, we're gonna handle that? Yes, please uh, visit in the short term jobguaranteenow.org uh, where we have frequently asked questions and you can also find a contact us um, tab to stay involved. Um, we also uh, would like you to visit the website to be able to uh, contact your representative um, and also to um, get your organization signed on. Thank you. And I thank everybody. This was an, a, a wonderful day, a great beginning, and we'll all be in solidarity as we move forward with an epic initiative to meet the moment. I'm grateful thank for you. all of you. And thank you to Martin and Coretta. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, folks.